Everything looks good. How's it going, everybody? And welcome to episode 211 of Master My Garden Podcast. Now, this week's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Smith again. And it's actually almost exactly a year since we spoke the last time on episode 160. And I suppose a year has passed since, and we're going to hear a little bit about how he's getting on in uh, Belfield and I suppose the progress that has been made, because I know there has been a lot of progress. But we're also going to talk about the upcoming Snowdrop Festival, which is on uh, Thursday the 8th through to Sunday the 11th of February. And seeing some of the pictures recently, particularly the picture that Paul posted under some trees. I'm not sure what trees there were, but you had Cyclam and Coom and snowdrops uh, mixed together and it just looks absolutely amazing so to see that in the flesh and to you know have a snowdrop tour and all that will be amazing so looking forward to hearing all about that and paul you're very very welcome to master my garden podcast thank you very much john good to be back uh, yeah, yeah full year later as you say but for... full year later yeah i only look back just to see what episode it was and it's it's almost it's almost a full year um since we last spoke and i suppose at that stage you told us the story of of moving into Belfield and what you'd found and all of that and you were very much looking forward to I suppose putting your own stamp on it while honouring you know all the elements that were already there so tell yeah. us a bit about what's happening and I, I know we spoke just off air about how how it has been a kind of a difficult year gardening wise just and we spoke about it a lot on the podcast between uh, particularly with wet we've just had just a really wet wet time for the last 12 months so What's been happening? How's the garden going? How's it looking? Yeah, yeah, we've had, as you say, I suppose, challenging first year weather-wise. Um, I officially started working in Belfield, I think, in mid-December 2022. Uh, it con- coincided with probably the coldest week of weather we had in a couple of years, but it went down to minus four or five here. Yeah. And that did away with a couple of things that I wasn't expecting because that was a bit sort of shock. And then, as you said, last spring, we were just saying there it was a lovely dry spring, a lovely our open weekends in February. We were, were so blessed because a little bit worried about, you know, parking in a field as you normally are and everything. But that was fine. And then March came and that was grand, Um, got a bit wetter then March and April. Um, And then May and June was lovely. But from July onwards, uh, you know, the heavens opened. Um, Funny enough, though, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing in terms of you know managing a garden it meant that I didn't have to waste wait I wouldn't say waste but spend any time watering uh, yeah. <laughs> because I hate uh, you know doing any more than's needed Um, even well up to the point of and you know it's bad then the pots at the back door of the house I have lots of uh, terracotta pots and different bits and pieces and I think between July and September I think I only had to water them maybe twice you yeah. know it was that heavy, the rain, that I didn't even need to water the pots in the middle of yeah, summer. Yeah. I was in them. It was that kind of, you know, mad, mad summer. But no, it's been good. Uh, like you say, a learning curve. Um, We've learned a lot. Uh, we've made plenty of mistakes. Um, But we've, yeah, yeah, come out the other side of it, I suppose. And the ch- weather is a challenge, but the weather, you know, the weather happens regardless. So yeah. we just have to uh, roll with that, I suppose. And yeah, we've made good progress. We've started into a few new projects. We've been working behind the scenes, doing uh, some more important things like funding and that type of thing. We've got ourselves set up in terms of equipment and all of that. So, yeah, we've really uh, pointed ourselves in the right direction. A huge amount of work done. Um, but, yeah, we still have a long way to go. Um, but we're getting there. We're certainly getting there. Yeah, brilliant. Actually, I, I was only just thinking as you were saying that about the, the weather and, and we'll move off that then because uh, <laughs> everyone's yeah, sick of it. <laughs> everyone's sick of it. But actually, one of one of the big things is peonies in, in Belfield and last w- with the wet, it must that must have been horrible on peonies, particularly because the big open open flower uh, just holds the water. I can't imagine that they had a nice time of it. No, they really didn't. Um, They really didn't do so well. Um. And now they're doing okay, uh, you know, in terms of how they're growing, but the flowers, yeah, they just, you don't get the real value out of them. And actually, yeah. funny, the thing I really noticed that suffered from the wet weather were the dahlias. Um, they just didn't seem to have any, you know, lasting in the flower at all. We've mainly single dahlias, which I know doesn't help to double and all those fancy dahlias do tend to last a bit longer. But I just felt that single dahlias this year were gone and out before you could even get a chance to appreciate them so uh, and yeah. they came early they flowered early we had them in early and they were doing well and then we had an open weekend in september and i thought great you know we're open for the dahlias and turns out that weekend the dahlias probably looked their worst two weeks later they were back but yeah yeah um, but that's part of the challenge yeah it's all part of it yeah and it's diff- it's going to be different the next 12 months will be different again i guess 
Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you're working on some projects in the background. A lot of the last 12 months has been centered around kind of steadying the ship, getting things back, pointing it in the right direction. But you're working on a couple of projects. So what what's the sort of projects that you're working on going forward? Uh, so in terms of the garden, kind of physically in the garden, we've been doing a few different bits and pieces. And anyone who visits in the next while will see we opened up a new pathway in the north border and we'll be hopefully opening up similar pathways through the blue borders and the south side of the garden uh, as the summer progresses. So that's a nice little woodland walk in the north border. Um, we had that all done lovely, edged in properly. And then one of these storms that we've had endless ones of came and it knocked the tree right down through the centre of the path. So that knocked us back another week or two, but that, that happens as well. <laughs> um, so that was put in. Uh, we've dug out the main entrance to the garden. There's a border as you walk in there. Uh, it used to be full of Hemerocallus and Procosmia. And to be honest, not a whole lot else. Um, Solidago, nothing of any real, um, you know, that would blow your mind away or nothing that was anything really fantastic. So mm -hmm. um, I took a notion towards the end of the summer and we had a, a day on soil and it was ironic. It was a day on soil and soil health and no dig. And two days before the no dig event, I hired a digger and I dug out the <laughs> entire bed <laughs> with a mini digger. Yeah. Um, and we got all all the soil that was in the bed because it was full of vetch and among other things and some, you know, plants. We kept the plants we wanted, obviously, but a lot of plants that we didn't either want or we just had far too many of and a lot of weed. So we took all of that and we piled it up in a corner of the field and we're going to hopefully cover that with plastic. And that will hopefully over a year or two kill all the perennial weeds that are in that. And then we'll use that soil elsewhere. And in the meantime, then we're adding in some new soil into that area and kind of re, uh, reinvigorating the soil that's there. So it's a bit of a drastic way of controlling the weed, but it had a huge amount of problem weeds. We are totally, um, I won't say the word organic because we're not certified organic, but we garden organically. Yep. So we don't use any pesticides or herbicides or anything like that. Um, but I just don't want to go down the route of getting it all certified. But I know in my own heart and everyone who comes there knows um, that we don't use any of it. So that's good enough for me. Um, and yeah, as a result, I wasn't going to do go down that route. So I said, you know what, this is the way to do it. And I know uh, Jimmy Blake up in Blessington does that a lot. And uh, it's a very drastic way of gardening, but... I want this bed to be kind of the first thing you see when you walk in the garden and be a bit of a wow factor, give a bit of impact. So as a result, it involved digging out the whole thing, which was a bit dramatic. But uh, hopefully as the year goes on, this snowdrop time now, the most you might see in it is some fresh soil. Uh, but as the summer progresses, uh, particularly into May and June and July, uh, we're going to try a lot of annuals in there this year. Hopefully you'll see a nice bit of colour. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I guess uh, I suppose you're, you're you're saying dramatic, but given the fact that the garden was neglected for a few years prior, yeah, probably weeds just got a little bit too established, and yeah, well, you know when when you're trying to do things, you know, in a non chemical way, I guess you, yeah. you have to do things like that because you know there is no other option to 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 clean it up. And, and you uh, hit the nail on the head there with the thing the weeds are getting out of control, and that was. Something I suppose I knew the weed problem was bad in Belfield, but I suppose maybe I was a bit naive as to how bad it really was. Um, so we really did find the vetch in particular in two of the borders, and that one included. So three of the borders really um, are very is very bad and continues to be, and we can only control that as much as we can. But over the next few years, my plan would be to do that same kind of method if this works with all of the different beds in the main part of the garden to really. Uh, go for it. We found a lot of mare's tail around the folly area in the centre of the wall garden, which is a bit of a nuisance. I think I know how it got there. I think it came in on mulch a few number of years or a good number right. of years. But even so, it's there now and you can't get rid of it. So yeah. uh, as anyone has ever tried to get even mare's tail, if you have chemicals, you can't get rid of it. So there's yeah, no it's problem. very, very difficult. Um, yeah, very it, difficult. It's one that we have. And then we have ground elder, uh, which isn't less of a problem. And actually the ground elder is in one area um that we are starting to develop now we tried a few things with ground elder i heard this thing that oak chippings um if you have a freshly cut down oak tree and oak chippings whatever tannin they release as they break down if you put fresh oak chippings onto ground elder it's meant to reduce them now we didn't have an oak tree but i did put out fresh chippings um and it seemed to have zero effect on the ground right. elder uh yeah. so maybe it has to be oak uh, but i decided in my wisdom i had we had just got some tree work done so i said let's cut down and put all these chippings on top of the ground elder didn't do anything to it so uh, at least it looked all right for a few months and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was hitting on the other thing that we did then was the no dig veg garden so we've started an entire third nearly two thirds of one area of the main 
kind of outer walled or outer borders of the walled garden has turned into a no dig veg garden um, and the old veg garden that was there will become a no dig uh, fruit and cut flower uh, garden so we're Brilliant. taking yeah a fairly dramatic chunk of the garden we've cleared a lot of stuff that was in there there wasn't really anything it was kind of like a holding area where okay. the stuff was thrown in there was no real rhyme or reason and now yeah it's turned into this no dig veg garden using the cardboard and layering up all of the different mulch and bark on it so that'll be exciting to see that progress brilliant and in terms of the organic matter are you use you're using compost is it your own compost or is it farmyard manure what are you using yeah, we're using our own compost. We're very lucky here, John. We've got, um, I suppose in a way, because the garden wasn't gardened for a while, all the compost heaps, which were the old stables, when this place was a stud farm in the 50s, there was loads of old stables in the backyard and Angela started to use them as her compost bins and they work quite well. They do have a concrete floor, which people who are diehard composters will tell you is not a good idea, but you do what, or you make me, or you make do what you have. So yeah, 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 yeah. It works. Um, and luckily it hasn't been touched in a while. So when we had a machine hired, we kind of turned it over. We found out that there's two of them that are a perfect compost and a good few tons in them. So I'm using that. And I also then bought in, uh, you know, composted green waste, which the advantage of that being it's totally sterile. Our own compost, I know won't be sterile. There's been an awful lot of weed flowing into it. So we'll put the bottom layer with our own compost and the top layer with this composted green waste and hopefully we'll keep the weeds at bay but where we are putting in the no dig veg garden there was a bit of ground elder so that would be an interesting um i won't say experiment i hope it works but yeah, yeah. Be interesting to see. veg garden uh you, how big is this and um i suppose the way to describe it is it's probably bigger than the average suburban garden the area that i've tackled which is probably far more than a bit of far more than probably should have been chewing in year one but um, when you have like, the borders in Belfield are 25 foot deep and this is probably nearly 100 foot so it's probably 100 foot by 25 foot so it's you know okay. it's a substantial plot of ground Um, but it was just along the border about a third two thirds of the wall garden edge and yeah good size and we're just going to do bark pot uh, growing area bark pot growing bark pot growing in a kind of fairly regimented thing the main reason as well we're doing this is that we'll clear the ground that we could potentially then start to think about changing it in a couple of years we may not keep the market garden there forever um, and the other reason being a lot of people visited and people who are members of the RHSI said you don't focus enough on veg which is actually a very fair point so we said well let's make a no dig veg garden here so we can have something to focus on veg with so yeah that's what we that's what we did and out of interest like what will happen with the produce is that the the volunteers is that who's going to end up with that are you going to be selling it or what's the uh yeah i mean it's not a huge amount well it will be a good bit of produce but um it'll keep me good and healthy for the end of 2024 <laughs> and any of the volunteers and anyone in the garden um yeah like it, it's not going to be massively productive part of the plan is to do to trial a few different things so maybe trial some of the more heritage varieties and different ones so um you know when i started gardening years ago the first thing i did was grow fruit and veg so i kind of i know i can do it so i'm not out to prove that i can grow fruit and veg i've done that um i won't call it easy but it's it's doable it's something that you know most gardeners come to garden and through growing veg uh, so I'd like to try a few different things. So I can't see it been overly productive, but yeah, certainly volunteers. And uh, as we always say, if anyone wants to volunteer, uh, get in touch with myself or get in touch with the RHSI office. And we're always looking for new people to help and you'll get some veg at the end of the year too. Brilliant. <laughs> um, you mentioned there uh, the that you had a soil open day and hmm. I'd actually forgotten about that. I know there was yeah. a, gr a group of gardeners um Conal up in Arden, I believe, was one of them, and yep. and others from around. And I could be wrong in saying this now, but did it finish in Belfield? Then was that the last day of it? That's it. Yeah, yeah. So how did that go? Because I know, I know, it was it was all talking about soil health, and it was a sort of an information sharing among among your different gardeners, and you were trying to see what was working. You know, soil amendments, composting, and all of that sort of thing. So maybe just because I I actually. I was speaking to Colin around that time and I, and I have meant to speak to him since to see how it actually all came together. So maybe maybe you, you might fill us in a little bit on it. Yeah, uh, well, Colin definitely knows a bit more than I do about it, but um, I was part of the group and the whole idea was it was a group of keen gardeners um, and basically all very interested in knowing a bit more about soil. Um, I was, I suppose, lucky enough to have, when I was in horticulture training in college, we did a bit more on soil, but most amateur gardeners, as keen as they might be, probably haven't got that grounding in soil or understanding of it. So it was a whole thing of teaching them, 
we had different experts in from different areas and different aspects of soil health. And as I said, people from the whole no dig area, people from looking at soil health in terms of the organisms in the soil, all of the, you know, microorganisms that live in the soil, how the fact that soil is alive, uh, looking at how soil, you know, um, how that's important with uh, the nutrients in the soil and how you can affect that with what you do in the garden and then looking at composting which is a huge area and obviously how to benefit your soil which mulching and composting as we all know are great ways of doing it so yeah, we were had a zoom every monday for a couple of every other monday for a while um all through kind of early spring then we took a break in the summer and then later in the autumn we had a few more and it culminated basically with this event in belfield where after learning all these different things, after hearing from a few experts, uh, they had done their bit of research and the group kind of put the theory to practice, really. And down in Belfield, we did our soil day. So we had people in the coach house. Uh, first time we had the coach house actually back in use after Angela had died. So it was great to have that building back. And we had people there doing lectures on soil. Um, we had Carl Melody from the Botanic Gardens. Um, Connell and a few of the others gave presentations a bit on the science of it because that's important even though you kind of roll your eyes to heaven when you hear soil science at first a little bit uh, but you have to kind of have a basic understanding and then we went out and we split into four groups and we did uh, no dig gardening we did composting on a large scale composting on a small scale and mulching in looking at how to do it on a practical level and then we also had uh, the pro biocarbon Karen from there and we had oh, yeah. Remu, we had Hall, and we had a few other people who were all involved um in the industry and the fruit of the farm dropped down bits and pieces and ollie from uh seaweed uh company uh, plants yeah plants uh yeah but he was uh dropping over bits and pieces so everyone who was involved kind of in that industry uh had a bit of a representation there and were just showcasing what they do and just getting people more aware about the soil and it sold out couldn't believe it good um, we had a full house, which I just didn't think a soil day in November in the middle of Offaly would be something that people want to go to. But I was very wrong. Um, yeah. And it literally sold out within a week or two. And yeah, uh, it was great. It was a good old day. Yeah, it's good. And and it's good that people are actually taking, I suppose, taking heed of it. And it's something that I've spoke about a lot on the podcast is soil health. And yeah. as, you, as you rightly say, the, the, the real deep science element of it can be a bit roll your eyes to heaven and a bit boring. But yeah, <laughs> when you have soil working correctly and, and with all the microorganisms working the way they should, then everything else is easy after that, um, or certainly easier. So mm. it's it's hugely beneficial, and I think it's good now that more and more people are talking about it and I suppose bringing awareness to it. So, yeah, well done on that. Um, obviously busy year ahead. Uh, lots of open days planned and the first one of them is quite soon so maybe tell us about those um snowdrops yeah. be, being a huge thing this time of year but also a really really important feature for belfield yeah absolutely it's probably our main feature to be honest in the garden um you know the gardens here are lovely uh most of the year round uh, i'm lucky enough that i live here on site so i get to see it pretty much every day of the year um but uh, generally speaking the best time in this garden is from february right through the month of february really and we are opening early february this year um we're not trying to coincide with too many dates so we're open from the 8th to the 11th of february the thursday right through to the sunday of that week um and the garden in belfield in snowdrop time really comes to life um at the front of the house we have quite literally hundreds of uh, different snowdrop varieties uh drifts and carpets of naturalized snowdrops mixed in with sickle and coom lovely uh, early other bulbs too, the like of iris reticulata and winter aconites and all of those lovely things uh, combined together in certain areas to give you a nice little tapestry of all that spring planting and then down through the woodland just endless drifts of snowdrops which Angela would have planted there over the years and actually last year after our open days uh, we took uh, two or three different days and occasions we brought out all our volunteers which you know there was nearly 10 or 12 of us and we dug up clumps of the snowdrops from different parts and we spread them all out through the front lawn so we're trying to have the whole of the front of Belfield basically one sheet of white carpet so when you drive in as far as your eye can see even and when you walk down you can see nothing but white that's kind of our that's our objective yeah. there and we'll be hoping to do that so yeah the, the winter garden in Belfield and I won't get into the whole thing of the snowdrops and the, the mad money that's paid for them and the fact that they are so and they are lovely there's no denying that uh, maybe they're not quite worth what uh, some people will pay for them but um, it is a fantastic thing and I suppose it's hope isn't it it's the first thing you see in the year oh yeah absolutely it is and uh, yeah I suppose the 
there is a huge collector element and, and there's a huge collection in Belfield. Uh, I know last year you were trying to get your head around the amount of varieties and I know there was some, uh, probably you have varieties that are on name there and I'm, I'm sure still is the case, probably going to be the case for a while until... I think Absolutely. I've conceded defeat on that. So I've came up with a plan, actually. So anything that I know we can identify, and even some of the experts have been down and haven't, when the experts can't identify them in my <laughs> head, well, then nobody can. So unless something is very easily identifiable or something is very distinct, what we've decided to do is actually get all those ones that are in the beds that don't have names and just naturalize them into the lawns. So Brilliant. over the years, we're going to have very interesting naturalized lawns with all of these more common snowdrops and then all of these slightly different ones. And hopefully as time goes by, they'll hybridize and who knows what we could have there in future years. So yeah, watch that space, I suppose. But yeah, our lawns are going to become naturalized with the normal snowdrops, but also all these different varieties. And that's what makes it interesting, I think. You never know what you find. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, as I said at the start there, you put up a, a, a brilliant picture of some trees with cyclamen coom yeah. and snowdrops through it. Like that, that is, if anyone hasn't seen that, was it, I'm not sure it was on the RHSI page the or RHSI page. actually, I did a talk for the RHSI on Zoom there about, uh, I suppose, two or three weeks ago and it was put up. It actually went a little bit viral. It got about 6,000 likes, um, you know, all of a sudden and five or 600 shares, um, loads of people commenting on it. And now, as you say, it is a gorgeous photo and it was just a perfect moment in time. The sunlight was shining perfectly on it. The yeah. cyclamen coom, which is the hardy spring cyclamen, uh, which does very well in the ground there. Um, people always PP, you know, oh, cyclamen, but don't think of cyclamen in the garden centre. They're no good at all. They're rubbish. Uh, you need cyclamen coom to get that spring cyclamen and combine that with snowdrops. Uh, and it really, just a beautiful tapestry. And there's a couple of crocus in there too. And it's just, uh, and to be honest, it was just that moment. It was like today, uh, Today has just been a very beautiful sunny day. Uh, the day before was horrible. So you just get that lovely sunny day. The sunlight's yeah. at the right level and you just got that perfect shot. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no, it was class. And it is class. And I suppose the, the one thing with that photographs, you know, when you look at it, it's a combination of snowdrops and cyclamen coom and a couple of other bits. But it's it's very simple. But what is in that photograph that you may not think straight away, like there's a good bit of time has passed to get that, yep. you know, to get that <laughs> naturalized the way it is. Um, yeah. I'm sure it was Angela that planted them back whenever, um, but time has passed. So that's why it makes it look like it is. It, it's, it's a phenomenal it's, photograph. It's uh, time and persistence, actually, that did that. So Angela would have every year bought a couple of trays of these cyclamen's coons. So she might have been putting in 40 little plug plants every single year. And even when I was a student there back 10 years ago, I would have been actually planting in a little bit around there. So she was persistently at it. She never stopped it. She kept adding bits and pieces. She saw they did well. And when she saw they did well in that space, she decided, let's go for it. Yeah. And as you say, yeah constant tweaking and even we this year had to do a little bit of work with the ivy around it so yeah while it looks lovely you do have to be it, it's the gentle touch and that's what i've discovered about gardening in belfield that you know you have to be a gardener but of course i don't like to be too heavy-handed so the gentle touch where appropriate can can work well and that's a good example i guess yeah brilliant so on the at the the open days so it's thursday thursday the 8th through to sunday the 11th and I know you're doing you're doing snowdrop tours around the garden um, and there's a few other events planned. So maybe just talk us through a day if someone's coming down to it, because I think for a lot of people, you know, even at this stage, a year on Belfield is still going to be quite new for a lot of people that won't have been there, you know, in the last year or they haven't been there for a while. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe tell us about how that day will run, what's what's planned. I know there's a few kind of events planned. and and uh, Yeah, there's a few bits on. Um, I'd say for anyone who hasn't been there before, uh, you're definitely hopefully going to enjoy uh, the sheets of the cyclamen and carpets, uh, coom, cyclamen coom and snowdrops. You know, uh, it really is a sight to see. And I one of the uh, few places in Ireland where you see it on that kind of mass. So uh, hopefully it'll be a treat if you haven't seen it. And what the plan is then, uh, I'll be doing two tours a day in the garden, guided tours. Um, they'll be, I think, 12 and 2 in the daytime. There's coffee shop inside, 17 coffee. Uh, we'll have plant stalls out in the backyard. Uh, I think Esker Farmer down from the north. Uh, Cold Blow Nursery Claire is over from over the road. And I think Field of Blooms, they're not going to be there every single day, but we'll always have a few plant sales of our own there. We'll be selling snowdrops because last year we didn't have uh, kind of the common snowdrop for sale and people were telling us off. So this year we've got uh, snowdrops in the green, which are just the bags of snowdrops dug up, ready to go. Um, We'll be selling bunches of 150 of them to people. Um, And inside as well, 
something a little bit different. We're going to be doing lectures on uh, some of the books in our library here because a local man, uh, author and historian, George Cunningham, has got involved with us here, helping us with our library collection, of which we have a good one, and uh, also amalgamating a few other library collections uh, with Angela's here. And we're getting working on that, getting that library collection together and then raising money to get the library project kind of up and running so the library will become a thing of the future. So George will be giving lectures on that. We'll also have book sales in the Coach House, uh, gardening books and other general kind of books as well, but brand new books there. Uh, so there's good quality and good value books there as well. So uh, a good bit happening, hopefully, for the few days nice one um you mentioned you mentioned there and we spoke about it on the podcast and you mentioned Esker farms again we spoke about it while they were on uh, snowdrops in the green it's it, it really is the best way to buy them yeah and yeah so for anyone that hasn't heard me talking about it before on the podcast you can get them in you know you won't get them everywhere but there is some places uh alta mount do them you can also get them in in belfield from the plant sales area and there's other garden centers but not many around the country that do them and it's yep. basically where you get the bulb with the green growth up on top. And it really is the the best way and probably the fastest way to start to get establishment of clumps of snowdrops within your own garden, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the problem with, you know, you can buy dried snowdrops in the autumn, as we've all seen. And people will often tell me, oh, I bought 100 dried snowdrops last year and maybe 50 came up or often maybe two or three only came up or none at all. And just the reason being, because snowdrops come up and flower earlier, they're into growth earlier. If they're in dried bag in August and September, they actually should be in the ground growing. And because they're a bit smaller too, they just don't take drying out. And definitely you can dry out for months and months. It'll come back to life, no problem. Snowdrops just don't like being dried out for that length of time at that time of year. And as a result, uh, rarely will a snowdrop actually come good after being dried out. So you're far better, like you say, John, buy them in the green and you'll get pretty much 100% success if you buy them in bunches of green like that. Brilliant. Um, I know there's lots of other days as well. You mentioned uh, potentially some, there's a plant fair in March. So maybe tell us about the other other events, other days that are coming up and any sort of teams that they're around. So I'm sure peonies are part of that somewhere along the way. Yeah, absolutely. So the big one, and hopefully it will be probably our biggest open day because it's only for the one day, March the 24th. That will be our plant sale. Um, Angela started the plant sales here in Ireland back in Fancroft nearly 25 years ago, I think. Um, so we're hoping to come back with a bang. She used to have them here a bit. So we're having a plant sale. We'll probably have about 20 so odd stalls. We'll have some food, tea and coffee. We'll have lectures in one of the coach houses as well. So someone will be lecturing about plants and gardening. Um, the garden will be open. I don't know if we'll be doing tours that day because I think we're going to have so many people. We probably just won't have the capacity to do tours on that particular yeah. day. Um, but yeah, there'll be a bit of life about the place that day. We're hoping for a big old crowd and hopefully lots and lots of plants being sold too and people uh, getting some of the nice early spring things because the plant fairs often happen later, but this will be the first real plant fair of the year and it'll be down in Belfield. And then after that, in May, we're open. Uh, that'll be really for the peonies um, in May uh, and the alliums, I suppose, too. So May uh, 18 to 19. June, we're open 22nd to 23rd. That's going to be for the roses. Uh, the roses in Belfield midsummer are always beautiful. Uh, July, we're open, hopefully, for the iris in the pond and a couple of other uh, highlights of kind of midsummer. Uh, midsummer in the garden is always lovely. We've got lots and lots uh, looking good. And then the final one of the year is in September 28th, 21st, I should say, the 22nd, that's Saturday and Sunday. And that final open weekend, we're going to be open for dahlias and salvias. Uh, we've been working a lot on the dahlias last year. We got lots of salvias hopefully they survived cold weather we've had um but yeah we've got lots and lots there hopefully to show you later on in the season too so plenty to see over the year uh definitely though our highlights will be the snowdrops but the crepe any garden has always got something to show and belfield is no exception to that i suppose here around brilliant yeah and tickets for any of these events or more information on them is the rhsi website i will put the the website link in the show notes as well um, but that's where people can buy tickets and that, isn't it? On the, on the... Yep, it's all on the website. And if you're a non-member, I think it's €8. Euro. If you're a member, you get in for free. You don't have to book online, but it helps if you do book online. Uh, you can also just turn up in the day if you can't be bothered to figure all that out. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so so that's Belfield. I, I know that's uh, enough to keep, keep anyone busy, but uh, knowing you, you probably have other, other things on the go or you're probably busy with other projects. Anything else happening that... Uh, is interesting at the moment or is uh, is Belfield taking all your focus at this point in time? 
Uh, Belfield's taking a good bit. Um, although last year, uh, myself and Dermot Gavin did a bit of work up in the north where we built a coronation garden for the king. Yeah. Uh, and that was a slightly random thing that I got involved in. Uh, out of, not out of the blue. I had worked with Dermot for a couple of years. But um, yeah, you never know what's around the corner is all I'll say. Um, and <laughs> but at the moment, Belfield is definitely taking up um, a good chunk of my time. Um, I've often said to people when I first started to work for myself again um we came back to Ireland January was very quiet and you wouldn't hear from anyone and this has been probably the busiest January I can ever remember um it's just been kind of non-stop uh but not in a bad way um it's great to be busy this time of year so yeah, for um sure. yeah Belfield is a big one but there's other things brewing and yeah um plenty to keep it busy hopefully watch the space yeah brilliant um so yeah there's as I say lots going on over the next couple of weeks we I'll put the links in the show notes and definitely for anyone that's interested in snowdrops uh, in, if you want to see that scene with the sickle and coom under the tree and the snowdrops, definitely get over there. Um, plant sales is interesting. The fact that I think that's kind of new now you were starting to get it up and going last year, but the, the fact that you can buy plants that are, that are on the, are in the garden now, I think that's a, a huge benefit. And I think people will like that as well. So you get all the all the links in in the show notes and uh, Paul, same as last year. It's been a really interesting chat. Uh, lots going on. I'm definitely going to get over this year. Um, didn't get over at all last year, but I will definitely get over at some stage this year. And Hold thank you. you very much for coming <laughs> on Master My Garden podcast. Thank you, John. So that's been this week's episode. A huge thanks to Paul for coming on. Uh, really interesting chat again, and great to hear and see. The developments over the last 12 months and definitely all of those open days you know whatever particular flower is is in feature that stage is definitely worth getting over listening to paul's talks seeing how the garden's developing and as you visit over the year and over the coming years you'll see the changes and the, and the and the i suppose paul putting his own stamp on it so yeah it'd be really really interesting chat and uh, that's been this week's episode thanks for listening and until the next time happy gardening